Welcome back to The Car Project. I'm Heather. I'm Sarah. And today we're covering a verse that is kind of a go-to verse whenever we think about the word grace. Yeah. It's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and this is what it says. Mm -hmm. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is a fairly well-known verse whenever you think of a verse that mm -hmm. is talking about grace. And so we're going to take our car Bible study guide. It is the method that we use in order to learn what questions to ask when studying the Bible. Cara spells C-H-A-R-A. The C stands for context. We're going to read around the surrounding passage. History is the H. We're going to look at the surround, uh, the culture of its day and understand the history that was going on at that time. A is for author, because we got to know who has written the, uh, this, uh, this passage. R is research, understanding the different word meanings, and then we go and apply the Bible verse. No matter what you, you learn today, if you have not downloaded this guide, this will help you in any Bible verse that you study. Additionally, there's study guides that will go with the specific Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 passage we're covering. So if you want to study this on your own at home or in a group, this is a great resource for you available right on our website. So Sarah, where, where do we begin? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've known this verse forever. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to hear what you, uh, how you unpack this for us. Where do we begin? Right. Well, when we were looking at Ephesians and talking about, well, what verse would we want to study? I, I asked Heather, I said, well, when you think about grace, I said, what verse do you, where do you go? Yeah. And she automatically went to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which is where I go too. And, mm -hmm. and like you said, so it really is, I think for a lot of us, this go-to verse on like, how do we understand biblical grace? So that's what we want to study today. Um, before we dive into the verse, we're going to get a little bit of history okay. and, and kind of get some context really uh, uh, surrounding this verse. So hang with us here. Let's get a little bit of background. Um, let's talk about history first and ask ourselves, who was it written to? And really, how does the Bible describe them? Mm -hmm. We can learn quite a bit. And I didn't do anything fancy, folks. I just read the book of Ephesians. And in fact, I read the book of Ephesians four or five, six times. It's not very long. And when you do that, you can gain so much out of it. So yes, you can go to the intro and a, uh, the, uh, to the book in a study Bible. I just simply read the book. And in Ephesians 1, 1, uh, it says, To the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. And in one fifteen, it says, I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. So we see that these saints had faith in Jesus, these saints in Ephesus, and these saints also, um, they include Gentiles, uh, which were just non-Jews. Uh, we actually see that if you were to read through the whole thing, and we're going to see, you'll see that come up later because um, so, it's addressed quite, quite frequently mm -hmm. throughout. So these, these saints had faith in Jesus. Cool. Okay. Both Gentiles and Jews. Cool. And then, right. then where do we go? Um, let's talk a little bit about the author and really um, one of the questions we look at under author is the style. You know, what literary genre is this? Well, we're in one of the letters. Mm -hmm. The book of Ephesians is a letter. It's one of Paul's letters. It's a favorite of ours. And um, so if you were to go to, I think it's on page 11 of our car Bible study guide, or is it 13, Heather? It's 11. Okay. Today, Good. today it's 11, but <laughs> so it has a whole um, section on literary styles. Yeah. Is that what you're yeah, speaking the, to? The nine major literary styles that we find in the Bible and letters, there's a question in there, Heather. What is the question for letters? Letters says uh, the epistles are apostles to early church uh, Christians. And it's the question is what instruction was mm -hmm. given and what prompted it? So what instruction is given and what prompted it? And the reason I want to ask this question is Ephesians is a little bit of a unique book. Um, we actually don't find in Ephesians any references to personal uh, names or the, the names of, 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 per, of different believers in Ephesus. Which was very common in most letters, wasn't well, it? Well, and like Paul, he did that. Like in Philippians, it's a very personal letter, and yeah. he does include names of people he knew. Yeah. It's like, well, gosh, maybe he didn't know them well. No, actually, Paul spent three years in Ephesians, um, and he had a really close, sweet, sweet relationship with, with the church there. You can see that in Acts 20, if you were to read around there. Um, that he knew them quite well. So the fact that he didn't include personal names in this letter suggests that this was a circular, circular letter, meaning it was written to the church in Ephesus and then was intended to be sent out and shared with the surrounding churches. The whole reason I'm bringing this up is because if it was intended to be shared and surrounded with the other churches, its message was meant for all believers, both then and today, actually. Yeah. One of the other tips that we love to give around letters is the, the idea, and you've already done this, Sarah, four times, but mm -hmm. the idea of reading the entire letter, because if anybody that receives a letter is going to read the entire thing in order to understand even a small little section of it. So that's something we recommend when you mm -hmm. read a letter. Make sure you're reading all of it. 
it, you know, that it really was a fun thing to do. And I didn't just sit there and do it back to back. I did it on different days. Mm -hmm. I even chose different Bible translations. Sometimes when I might go to, I have my go-to Bible here, I have it all marked up. So I would go to a different translation that's not as marked up. And, and each time I did, something new would stand out to me. Mm -hmm. So that's really fun. Um, especially, I mean, this book isn't that long. I think there's, what, five, six chapters? Yeah. Not, that's not very long. Um, okay. So another, that was under author. Mm -hmm. That was literary style. Another question we can ask is really about the author's purpose. And the author we've, I think we've already kind of hinted at is Paul. Yeah. Uh, he wrote quite a few of the letters in the New, New Testament. But what was his purpose um, behind this letter? And again... A great way to determine the purpose is, is as we mentioned, reading the whole letter. Um, when we do that, we see in chapter three <clears throat> that God, or um, yeah, that he, Paul says, God gave me in verse, I'm sorry, chapter three, verse two, God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. And in 3, eight, though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. So you can see that Part of Paul's calling, his purpose, is to let the Gentiles know about the gospel of Christ. So it's not just the Jews, it's the Gentiles. Yep. But mm -hmm. what I love, you know, what's interesting that what you just read, Sarah, is that Paul actually refers to his purpose as a special responsibility or privilege. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's one he doesn't deserve. I don't know how often I actually can think about the times I'm serving as a privilege or an honor. And we see it so well reflected in the way that Paul is talking. I love that. Oh, I love that call mm -hmm. out. And if you were to continue reading in chapter three, you would just see the most beautiful prayer mm -hmm. um, because of the special gift that God gave him. He just falls on his knees in prayer. It's just beautiful. Beautiful. Um, so great call out. So now that we have a little bit of the background, a little bit of the history, we know a little bit about the author and the, you know, the literary style, um, and, and that this was a, you know, a message intended for the, the church in a, broad, a broader sense. Mm -hmm. um, let's dive into our verse again. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and reread that. And as I do, the question that we're going to ask ourselves is one of our research questions, which is really one we actually like to start with. What observations or questions do you have when you read this passage more than once? So Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and you read it again. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So when I did that, I, I, have, I made three observations about grace. And truly, I just really broke this verse down into three parts. The first one is, God's grace brings salvation. We saw that when it said, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. The second one is, grace is a gift. And that, that we see from, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. The third thing we can see and learn about grace is I can't earn God's grace, not by works so that no one can boast. I love that just from the text alone, you're pulling out some mm -hmm. really cool observations that I'm assuming you're going to help us dig into yeah. now. Yep. Because this is really fan fascinating. Yep. Let's dive into those. God's grace brings salvation. It's a gift and I can't earn it. Those three things. Great. Okay. Um, so that first one. Again, God's, God's grace brings salvation, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. So that's where we're, we're seeing that. Um, one of the questions we might want to ask is, is a context question. And as you mentioned in the intro, Heather, that's really looking at the surrounding text to see if, hey, is this supported anywhere else? Mm -hmm. Can we, does God's grace really bring salvation? Right. Well, again, just by reading the book, and, and so in book context, we'll see that in a couple of places, but Ephesians 1, 7 through 8 it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Mm -hmm. So it's because of, of God's grace that Christ brought redemption and forgiveness of sin. That's really another way to define salvation is that we were redeemed and forgiven. I like that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you define that word salvation because I'm sure that there's a lot of definitions we could come up with, but this is sure. very clear. Mm -hmm. Redemption and forgiveness of sins. And what I, I love about it is he's, um, you, you mentioned in this verse, this idea that he's not stingy either. It's like there's this riches of God's grace that he's mm -hmm. lavished on us. There's this outpouring we see from God uh, of, of how he is so forgiving and so um, willing to just love on us. It's just fantastic. Don't you this, love this, that? This grace is so abundant. Don't you love that? We see that actually a couple of times in Ephesians, Paul saying this, just the riches, richness of God's grace. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really beautiful. In fact, we do see it again in Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. And it says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ. Even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. That it's a repeated right there. You are saved by grace at the end there. So we just read two additional verses in addition to the one we started with, mm -hmm. really. So there's three here that we've looked at that, that support the idea that God's grace um, brings salvation. So this isn't just a something the author is whispering. This is definitely something the author is shouting. Mm -hmm. 
And honestly, we could keep going. We can look at Bible context. We could look at a lot of Bible context. And um, but I think I'm going to pause there. And I, I could be wrong, but I think maybe that's something that a lot of people maybe, but maybe if you've grown up, maybe reading your Bible a little bit, you don't struggle with this idea that God's grace brings salvation. Mm-hmm. Maybe you do. What's interesting, though, is they would have struggled with it back then, Mm -hmm. most likely. So that's where I want to, I want to do a little tangent over to history. All right. All right. Where are you Um, you bringing us on history? Which question? uh, The how would the original audience have heard this question? Again, uh, or this, uh, this message. I'm just pulling a question out of our CARA guide like we do. Uh, we don't use all of them all the time, but sometimes we pull out one here or one there. Or we usually pull out, you know, a couple here a and couple. there. And um, it really helps unlock this. So how would the original audience have heard this? That this whole idea that it's God's grace that brings salvation. Mm-hmm. Um, so remember that Paul was called to share the good news uh, with the Gentiles. And in chapter 3, Paul describes this ministry to the Gentiles as a mystery that was previ- um, that was kind of a mystery to the previous generations that is now made known through Christ. That's part of Paul's ministry was to make this mystery in Christ this uh, uh, known to, to the church. Uh, so what was this great mystery? I think it summed up pretty good in Ephesians 3, 6. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So truly we're seeing here... Jesus changed everything. I mean, this would have been pretty um, revolutionary <laughs> uh, to the original audience. Historically, and you find this again in Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16. I'm just going to recap a little bit that we find there. Historically, there was a wall of hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. That's literally what it says, mm-hmm. a wall of hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Jesus, but he made peace with the Jews and the Gentiles. And now both groups are one instead of two very divided groups. Um, and Jesus did that by reconciling both groups to God through his death on the cross. And then so Jesus broke down that wall of hostility by ending the Old Testament law with all of its commandments and regulations that were given to the, that had been given to the Jews. Mm-hmm. So for, so imagine for a moment, Heather, and sometimes I think this is fun, kind of try to put yourself in their shoes, right? right? Imagine for a moment that you were an Israelite or you were a Jew and you followed God's law by doing the works of the law, right? You believed you really had earned that salvation, mm-hmm. right? That that you were that your inheritance. Um, God gave you the law, and you were you were doing it. Um, and I think this is why Paul is stressing so much this idea of grace, because it's grace that saves you, not works, not works of the law. Tons of Bible context around that too. We'll hit a couple more of those. Um, but not only that, not only that, but Jesus offers the same way for you to be cleaned is the same way these unclean Gentile sinners that they're going to be saved. They're going to be saved the same as you um, to be co-heirs and members of the same body. I mean, they had been going, are you are you kidding me? Well, and what's, what's interesting is if you understand anything about the culture back then, we learned this from books like Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, and there's a few other books out there like that, mm-hmm. where it talks about the history of those uh, of that people. It was very familial, and it was very much connected to your family. And so this idea that your inheritance mm-hmm. and what you get as a family member all of a sudden now is of equal value to the person that's getting adopted into the family. That's what Paul's saying here. Yeah. He's saying that these people that were not born into the family are now being adopted in and are being treated the exact same as somebody that was born into it. That would have been game changing for them because that's not how they think. It was very much a mindset of this is my family. And now you're saying we're all one family. Mm, I, they're they're totally different from us. Mm-hmm. We, we are separated. We mm-hmm. shouldn't be connected. Mm-hmm. So this would have been a difficult transition. Yeah, which I think is why Paul is hitting this idea of grace so hard yeah. in this letter. Uh-huh. Hey guys, it's it's through grace. It is. We're all saved the same way through God's grace. There's nothing you can do. They're all getting mm-hmm. ad- getting adopted in and are part of the family. Absolutely. So that's a great segue into the the second point that we're going to look at, which is the grace is a gift. Mm. And in, again, I'll reread the verse again. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So it's really that part right yeah. there um, that we're going to focus on now. So one of the questions that we look at under research is um, is to define it. Look at it, look it up in the the original language. Yeah. You know this this word grace. So you can look it up through like Blue Letter. You know, uh, is that blueletter.com or blueletter.org? I can't even remember now. Blue Letter. Bible.org. Bible. Thank I you. Think. Yes. Or Bible Hub. There's a bunch of uh, it's something like that. Greek lexicons that are free online for you to go and look up uh-huh. words so that you sound smart like what we're trying to do uh-huh. right now, although we're not sounding very smart. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying, Sarah. <laughs> but wait, but wait, I've been practicing how to pronounce this word. Oh, okay. All right. I think go. it's Karis. 
Kara. It's kind of similar to Kara. Yeah. I mean, really, it's, it's a C H A R. This is the word for grace, for grace. in Greek. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Which means favor or goodwill, a gift or blessing and kindness. Mm. Um, which, by the way, Kara it means joy. Yeah. In Greek. If you didn't know that, mm-hmm. fun little, fun little, little tidbit. tidbit. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so one, one of those definitions that kind of stood out to me, and I think what we see a lot in the letter uh, to, in the, in the, to the Ephesians, is that grace is a gift. Mm. It's goodwill, it's a favor, but grace is a gift. And we see that, I think, quite, in quite a few places here. Um, let's look at some more context. And again, we're going to look at book context. You love Ephesians. I, I, I guess this. I'm taking you all over Ephesians. So. But this is, it's just showing you how much of a theme this is in this book. I am. Yeah, yeah it, it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so book contest, context. So this is actually one that we already saw when Paul talked about his ministry to the Gentiles. Um, in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it said, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. This grace was given to me, the least of all saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. So Paul saw, again, he saw his ministry, saw his calling as God's grace, as a gift. How cool is that? And and really not just his own calling. If we were to go to the next chapter in chapter 4, 7 through 8, it says, now, now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to the people. A couple of verses later, in verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. These are all gifts given out of God's grace mm-hmm. to, to Paul, to each of us, um, to, to build up the body of Christ. I love that. So I just, I'm showing these because I'm, I'm seeing this word grace used interchangeably with the word gift. Mm-hmm. And uh, we also see that if we were to go to Bible context, you know, just expand out a little bit more. If we were to head over to Romans 4, 4 through 5, again, this is Paul speaking. He says, now to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. Well, and you found that Bible Bible context just by looking at cross references, yeah. right? Yeah. See, I love this because what we're seeing in this emphasis around the Bible about this idea of a gift. And when I think of a gift, the nature of a gift is that it's given freely. Like it's not yeah. something I've earned, I've deserved. It truly I mean, when I give a gift to my kids, it's a gift. I don't expect anything in return from them. I mean, unless it's their allowance and they're doing chores, that's a totally different thing. That's not what we're talking about here. This is gift, um, and the gift is free, um, mm-hmm. and nothing uh, is owed back. And so I love that we're seeing that kind of doubled over in any single verse you've pulled out so far. Yeah. No, and that, that leads right into our, our third point. I, and I love that that um, insight that you give to a gift. I mean, really, we, that's something that we can understand just by thinking about it, right? right? We don't typically give gifts to ourselves. I mean, I mean, sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we might, but by the nature of it, a gift isn't, it's, it gets given to us. It's given to yeah. us and it's something that we, it is not earned. Yep. yep. And that's our, our third point. I can't earn God's grace. Mm. And we see that in the very last part of our verse, um, probably Ephesians 2, 9 at this point, not by work so that no one can boast. Yeah. Um, all right. So if now let's look at actually some immediate context. Let's just hunker in around our verse here. And because I wanted to show you that not only is uh, a grace something that we can't earn, we actually really don't deserve it in the first place. Okay. Um, which might be some hard for some people to hear. And I know maybe at one point it was hard for me to hear. But, okay, so Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, this describes our old life. Um, prior to believing in Christ, it says, In you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as others were also. Oh my goodness. This this verse mirrors um, a, a podcast we've already done in Romans 5, 10 on enemies of God. Yeah. So go listen to that if you're interested in this in this topic of ra- God's wrath or being an enemy of God Romans 5:10 is a great podcast to be able to dive deeper into this subject but I'm assuming that's not where you're taking us yeah no that's a good a good shout out there yeah. um okay so in verse 4 you're gonna love how this starts out it says but God okay, okay. so it continues on it continues after that. on so here we are we're tra- dead in trespasses mm-hmm. to sin but yep. God here's here's our old life 
But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches, there's our riches Mm. again, the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. So God's grace truly is, it's undeserved. It is um, not because of us. It's not because of how good we were, how deserving we were, right? It's because of this merciful God who loves us richly, lavishly. I love it. Mm. Well, and it's great because one of my cross references points me to Titus 3, 3 through 7. Actually, it hunkers around 5, but uh, the the surrounding context helps. It says this, Mm. at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness Mm. and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously. This is that lavish word Uh again, generously uh through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. I love that passage in Titus 3, and I'm glad you brought that up because it is such, you see so many parallels Mm -hmm. to what we're studying here in in, in Ephesians. Um, yeah, this this old life, this, hey, we were too, once foolish and undeserving and all of these things, but but God, because of his mercy, because of his lavish grace, we saved us. Um, so that juxtaposed. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's beautiful. So thanks for uh, bringing that up. And actually, if we were to have kept reading in Titus and we were to have read one more verse, um, I think it's interesting that this is where it goes next. It says, this is a, tr- this is a trustworthy saying. I'm in Titus 3.8. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Mm. Um, I I find this interesting in in part because we see something kind of similar again back in Ephesians, Ephesians 2.10. We haven't covered Ephesians 2.10. It's a verse that follows immediately after the verses we're studying. And I'm guessing this might be familiar to many of you. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here's why I find both of those those interesting. We've been spending a lot of time talking about um, the fact that we're not saved by works, right? Mm-hmm. It's by grace and we're not saved by works. We don't deserve it. And then, it. and then it follows with, hey, but you're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And then that passage in Titus saying, um, I urge you to devote that yourselves to doing what is good. So you're not saved by good works, but I urge you to do to do good works. Um, there's a there's a lot here I want to say <laughs> about this, and so um, one of them is uh, one of the things here is it talks about boasting in our in our, our passage in Ephesians that mm-hmm. last part it said uh, not uh, we, so that we can't boast right not mm-hmm. by ourselves not by our own works so that we can't boast. Um, the idea here is that we can, <laughs> that remember when you talked about God's God's gifts that He's given to us, the, the, His calling, His per, Paul's purpose to preach to the the, the Gentiles, mm-hmm. and He gives these gifts to uh, to us to be teachers or apostles or different different gifts, spiritual gifts to build up the church. Yeah. Those are all gifts from God. And I, what I love about um, Ephesians two ten is those gifts are God's handiwork, and and so it's. Um, when we when we operate in those gifts, it should be reflecting on God and who mm-hmm. God is, and um, all pointing to Him. All pointing to Him, mm-hmm. and I I had this example as I um, we moved into a new house um, uh, like six months ago or so, and and it's spring now, and so I've been out in this garden. We inherited this garden. And it's, it's really something. I'm sure it really was something at one point. I mean, the, the previous owner had died two years before we bought it. And it was his, his handiwork. Mm-hmm. It was his masterpiece. This garden was. It's incredible. I and mean, there's paths and fountains. And everything was very, very well thought out. And, and so even though I never met this man, this man who created this garden, this past week as I've been spending all this time out in my garden, um, it's, it's been interesting because I feel like in a sense – it's all pointing to him who created it, you know, and in a way, like, I, I feel like I, I, I'm getting to know him, even though I never met him. Um, but it's, 
it's just that, this idea that that our good work should be pointing to and reflecting that God, mm -hmm. we're, we're His man ha masterpiece, we're His His handiwork, yeah. um, and we were chosen to do good works. We're not chosen because of our good works. I think that's a, a really important shout out here. Yeah, well, and I'm also going to shout out that, you know, we could easily go to James 2.10 that talks about faith without works is dead, yeah. which oftentimes yeah. when we hear that, it feels like we're contradicting this, but it actually complements quite nicely what mm -hmm. we're talking about because James is speaking to the response that we should have because of our faith. Mm -hmm. Well, we should, this it deserves its own podcast. We will do a podcast on James uh -huh. 2, 2.10, uh, so, so stay tuned for that. But I think that it's worth noting that this is an emphasis we see throughout the Bible mm -hmm. about this idea that the works out of it in both Titus in both Ephesians it's mm -hmm. out the outpouring once we have faith once we understand who God is and his lavished love for us the natural outpouring is that we will want to go and love others mm -hmm. and to and to do good works well and truly if we tr if we truly understood this gift that God gave us and how incredibly powerful that is um, if we truly understood the cost that Christ paid, if we truly understood what it meant to be a Christian, that should translate in doing good works. Absolutely. It, it should flow out of us. Yeah, completely. Um, to a degree that, um, honestly, I'm, I'm not there. I think I, Every if, day if I we have, truly yeah. understood it... Um, it's it that's quite a call to action we will see that in james yes so i love that stay, shout out stay tuned yes <laughs> it's we, coming we want to give it james the time and attention, attention it deserves yeah, so exactly. yes um i love that okay so let's let's recap real quick these okay. three things that we've been talking about okay god's grace it brings salvation god's grace is a gift mm -hmm. and it's something that i can't earn mm -hmm. those three things are what we've been talking about but there's actually one important piece that we haven't covered, and it's just this little tiny little phrase in our verse. Um, and it's, it's, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And so the reason this is so important, I think the question that needs, it begs to be asked here is, does this mean, I mean, does this mean everyone is saved? I mean, if it's a gift, if it's something I can't earn, and it's by God's grace, his mercy, his kindness, does this mean everyone's saved? Well, there's that key little word there, through, through faith. Through faith. We yeah. can't neglect that. Um, okay. So, cause we actually have to respond. Yeah. There's, there's a gift that's been offered, but we actually have to accept the gift and mm -hmm. that's how we accept the gift is through belief and through faith. So let's go to Bible context. I want to read Romans 3, 22 through 26. Heather, maybe listen for some repetition here, if Got you it. would. Yep. All right. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in, in his blood, received, received through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who who has faith in Jesus. Faith, faith, faith. Mm -hmm. It's at least repeated three times. Mm -hmm. That's It's powerful how much this this one small little passage really emphasized not only the faith, but faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Like mm -hmm. It is very obvious that it's, it's trying to um, tie this concept of um, understanding that it's through our faith that we are, that we are saved. Yeah. 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 It's God's grace. It's God's kindness um, that he's offering us. This is gift that he's offering us, but it is, our, it's through our faith in him that we're receiving uh -huh. the gift. And that's how we're, that's how we're actually receiving it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, friends, I think it's time we can, apply. we can start to apply this. Okay. That's our, so. that's our last A in Kara. So yes, yeah. we should probably do that yeah. at some point we in this usually podcast. Like <laughs> We usually like to wrap up with apply. I mean, that's that's the whole point, right? Sure. We yeah. want God's word to transform us. Yeah. Um, and this is one that really should mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, what questions would you ask us out of the apply section? Uh, there's a lot. I, I, I think a good one to always start with is prayer. Um, you know, pray, Lord, what do you want me to learn? Um, mm -hmm. How do I apply this to my life? And boy, I think, I think we kind of just hinted at one for me anyways, that, um, this idea that, Hey, when I truly understand God's grace and this gift that was offered to me, who is so undeserving, mm -hmm. I really do want to, I, I want his love to flow out of me. And I want, um, those, those, I want to do good works, uh, not because I'm trying to earn my salvation, but because I was given salvation freely. Yeah. So I guess a prayer to understand his grace, yeah. um, in, in the fullness that I can, mm -hmm. like, and that may, but it's so transformed my life 
that it affects the way I live. No, and I can think think oftentimes we really do feel like we want to try to earn that gift in some way or fashion. Yeah. Like my natural inclination yeah. is to want to build a checklist out of the things I need to do to be able to be okay with God. And what I hear here is that we get to just rest in understanding that mm-hmm. if we accept the gift, it's just through our faith and faith alone, we get to rest in that. Mm-hmm. And that the, out, the, the works come as the outpouring, but man, to be able to rest in just being okay with God giving us this gift lavishly, even when we don't deserve it. That is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I feel like even just walking away, understanding that alone would be a huge win because I think it's easy for me to say no, but I want to go do something else. I want to do more because I feel Mm -hmm. like I need to do it. I love that you were using that word rest. That Mm -hmm. is so true. Mm -hmm. You you just rest in Christ's already completed work, Work. right? That's exactly Uh, right. There's a lot of freedom in that. Mm -hmm. A lot of freedom. Wow. I love that. Um, Another apply question I might ask, um, particularly in this one, it is one of our favorite ones, but it's ask, what do you learn about God, his character, his desires, his his attributes. And boy, there were some real standouts lavish here. Lavish love, his gra- or lavish right? his grace and his mercy and richness. Oh, mm-hmm. so good. To, to people who were so undeserving, mm-hmm. I, including myself. <laughs> oh yeah, I was going to say, put me in that camp. Right? Like it just so gracious. Yeah. That's so really loving, good. so merciful, so kind. Um, and, and finally, uh, I mean, there's, there's several we could ask here. We kind of already talked about, hey, does this apply to, to, to them back then or us today? Is it cultural timeless? And well, it, it, it's timeless, friends. Yeah. Like this, this applied throughout the early church, but also to the church today. This well, especially considering this letter was going to be passed around multiple churches. Yep. It, it's supposed to be a timeless truth yep. that we should be hanging yep. on to. Um, and, and another thing we might uh, do and apply is to memorize a verse. And this is one of my favorite <gasps> verses that I've um, committed to memory and yeah. um, and use point to often. Very, very. Mm-hmm. Because just honestly to remind my own heart. Yes. Um, more often than not, it's reminding myself of who I am through Christ. And mm-hmm. oftentimes I think I have to be something different. But no, I just get to receive the gift of grace. And that's mm-hmm. something I have to remind myself often of. Hey, so Sarah, if if we were to do this type of Bible study around Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 in a small group, if you were a leader of a small group or you're involved in a small group, what are some tips you would give to uh, to people that are in a group doing a Bible study around this passage? You know, I th- I think um, one thing that comes to mind, there's you could really have some great conversations o- around the word grace and what does it mean, um, especially if you're coming at it really from maybe different different faith backgrounds, perhaps, or just grew up in, in different church denominations mm-hmm. or none at all. You know, to even start your conversation with, hey, what what assumptions do you bring to this word grace? What does it mean? Mm-hmm. Maybe how is it used in our culture? How was it used in your faith tradition growing up? What do you think it means? Um, could be really helpful because I, I hear this word a lot. And yeah. I think it is a word that I've heard. I, I know I've heard used and defined differently. So that would be one. Yeah. Define define language. Okay. Define define what this um, what the word grace means. Um, and another one actually would probably be very similar, define beliefs. And again, ask, ask questions around, hey, in, in what do you believe? What assumptions have you been taught about, about salvation? Well, I mean, salvation is another word we can define. Yeah. But um, about how one is saved. What, it, what does that look like? Is, is it really not by works at all? Or, or do, you, do you bring some assumptions to the mm-hmm. table that, you know, there are certain things you need to do? So just knowing that, you know, you're, you're, if you're in a group setting, yeah. people might have different opinions about those. And if, especially if you have a, a group where you can have a real kind of, if you know them well and mm-hmm. have a, a, just a true authentic conversation, uh, that could be a really rich conversation. Yeah. And here, reminder, we do have study guides on our website that walk you through questions. So if you want to lead this in a Bible study of any sort, we have the resources available. And of course you have the answer guide by listening to this podcast. Uh, so, uh, you know, thank you, Sarah, for walking us through this passage today, one of my favorites, and I, I really am walking away with a new appreciation for how much detail we get in the book of Ephesians itself, uh, mm-hmm. and how how, yeah. how interesting it, we were able to pull just from the text itself and not having to know a lot of other tools and tri- tri- tricks to be able to understand this passage. Um, if you love what you're hearing and you love learning how to study the Bible, make sure you like, subscribe, and comment on this video and on this podcast. I also would love for you to be able to go to our website and access other resources, including the CARA Bible study guide. Great resource for you as you're studying the Bible. And we hope you join us next time as we uncover another verse that's going to help you learn how to study the Bible. Thanks for joining us.